So we're back here with me, your host, Valentine St. Aubin. You're listening to Esoteric Discussions here on Peterborough FM. And I'm joined by a great guest tonight, Andy Lloyd, and we've been talking about um, Planet X, and we're going to continue our discussion. Um, he's given us a, a great introduction and, uh, and you know, background and history to this subject. Um, Andy, are you with me? Yeah, hi. Okay, there. So, um, so let's continue our chat. Um, what I was wanting to get into next now is where we are, you know, um, in terms of the whole 2012 issue. I know a lot of people are um, becoming aware of 2012 mainly because of um, movies such as 2012 and other things getting people's attention. Um, but obviously, this is something that's uh, that you know in the metaphysical community we've known about for quite some time. Um, how does in your opinion, how does Planet X fit into all of this? I mean, let's let's talk about this Comet Elenin, for example. There's been a lot of stirrings on the internet about what Comet Elenin is. So I'd like you to maybe just um, give me your idea of uh, how you find all of this information with Comet Elenin, because it's, it seems to be they're trying to tie it to catastrophe and um, the stirrings of 2012. Yeah, um a lot of people have predicted down the last few years that, um, which was linked in actually with the Colburn Bible thing that you were mentioning earlier on, yeah. um, that, that there would be a return of planet Nibiru, which is, you know, from my point of view, this dark star thing. Um, and uh, in Sitchin's work uh, to do with Nibiru, um, he's got this planet going around a 3,600-year orbit, and it passes into the solar system like a comet. Um, and will approach uh, our planet. We won't actually get close to our planet. We'll approach it, you know, sort of coming near the asteroid belt, effectively. Um, and th this happens every sort of three and a half thousand years. And people argue the toss over whether that time of its return is now, or whether it's completely the opposite way around, and it's, you know, sort of some time off in a thousand years or so. Um, and I'm of the camp that says it's the long way out. But there are a lot of people who argue that it's coming now, and they do so because they argue that um, the last time it came back was during the time of the Exodus. Yes, yeah. And they say that there's a biblical description of this planet, and it was all tied in with, you know, the pharaohs and, and Moses coming out of Egypt with the, with the Israelites. Um, so they... Uh, make a quite a sort of strong argument about this, and um, they say that you know this is a sort of important time now, and it's all the more important because you know the Mayans who created this stunning, absolutely stunning calendar, this really really complicated, complicated mathematical construction, um, but effectively built by a bunch of farmers out in you know Mexico in the in the in the um, in the jungles of uh, Yucatan, um, they came up with this incredibly complicated mathematical system to describe very, very long periods of time, very, very accurately. And this complex calendar was set up in such a way that it started, I think, around about 3000, 3100 BC, something like that, and would end in 2012, or at least a phase of it would end in 2012. And the reason why people get very anxious about this is because their cousins, the Aztecs, also had similar type of calend calendrical systems. And they had mythologies about previous ages which had come to an end catastrophically. So um, you'd have a sort of one, end, one age coming, you know, ending in fire and yes. one end in, mm -hmm. in a great deluge and so on. Mm -hmm. And th this uh, age would, you know, this was, the, I think, the sixth age now that we're in. Um, and that you know that that would eventually the sixth sun would come to an end as well. So when you tie those two things in together, it doesn't take an awful lot of imagination to get anxious about an incoming massive body that could render a massive catastrophe to our world, which would fit with both this prediction of planet X plus also the main prediction about the end of their calendar. And the Mayans never mm -hmm. said what would happen at the end of the calendar. That's they, right. They mm -hmm. just had a calendar ended. That's right, yeah. But it, it sets it up for a, a very sort of anxious time for us because if 
as you were saying earlier, you have a sort of a, an affinity for um, ancient mythologies, ancient beliefs, stuff that you have a spiritual feeling for, um, that you can tie yourself into sort of the way of thinking of the ancients, you can see that there may well be something, an element of truth in what they've said that our modern scepticism tends to sort of, you know, say, oh, that's a lot of rubbish and people throw it out the window. Exactly. But, but who's to say that there was not actually some sort of belief system behind this calendar mm -hmm. that, that is lost? Well, I was just going to add to what you've said, and you've said it very well. We also have the Hopi prophecy as well, and, um, you know, that, as they say, we're coming into this time of great purification. But they also give us a few pointers as well, and they talk about the, the blue Kashina star, um, which they believe has come and gone, and now they're waiting for the red Kashina star to, to make its appearance as well. Um, you know, so how how do you feel about Comet Ellen, and is... Do you think that it is making these alignments that people are claiming and, and kicking off this seismic activity? Um, I did a really, really interesting thing with uh, Richard Hogel and Project Clamalot, and we had a sort of a round table discussion about Ellen, and, and, and people have got very, very different opinions about this. Um, I think it's fair to say that given the sort of sense of anxiety about a potential Planet X return, that any comets that show up this next 12 months are going to be uh, significant in the minds of people who are worried about this. Um, the thing that actually makes Elenin stand out, because in actual fact, as a comet, it's pretty lousy. I mean, it's a rubbish comet. It's, very, it's very quite small, small though, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, you know, even, even sort of established, uh, really good astronomers are struggling to get any kind of decent image of this thing. I mean, yeah. you look at photographs on the internet of, of coming out of uh, the sort of scientific community, and it's just a little. This is very spot. dim, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not it's not a very exciting comet, and in, in actual fact, it's it's pretty much at its brightest point like next week. Um, it could be breaking up at the moment. Well, I was about to say because I think I I've heard uh, is, uh, if it's not um, the the person that discovered it himself saying that he thinks it's now breaking up. Yeah, yeah. and it, it that would be normal for a comet because mm -hmm. yeah. um, if, if you have a long period comet that's been far, far out in the solar system, been frozen for donkey's years, and really has never got anywhere close to the sun, which Ellen is probably one of these things. And it approaches the solar system, uh, as you were saying before, it got perturbed, it just got sort of jostled out of its position and comes flying in towards the sun very, very fast, and gets captured by the sun into a different kind of orbit, which is what's happening to this thing. Um, comets work like this. The reason why you see comets in the sky is that the, the, the heat of the sun blasts out all these volatile uh, frozen um, chemicals, water and so on, and it blasts out this huge tail, which is, you know, this immense tail that we see. Um, and that actual uh, event is, it can be catastrophic for the comet itself, because all of these ices are melted, they're all flying off, and it, it's, it's a sort of a reactive brew that's going on, and, and it can cause an explosion, effectively, that rips apart the comet. So, um, during its very exciting sort of movement around the sun, it runs the risk of breaking apart, and that could be happening. Now, one of the things I think is very curious about um, Ellen in itself, and I think one of the reasons why it's caught imagination, perhaps more than it might have done otherwise, is, is the name of it. And this discoverer was um, Leonid Elenin, who's a Russian astronomer. Um, and he's, if you, t <laughs> if you take his name, and split it up a little bit. You've got Leo, which is the constellation it was found in, and then Elenin, the first three letters of which are Eli, E L E. And in the film Deep Impact some years ago, yes, I remember it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when when they, they they were talking about this potential catastrophic impact coming in, and and that you know they co the government covered it up, and you know that's kind of a blueprint for mm. what people think might be happening now with Nibiru. Yeah. yeah. Um, e L E. Uh, is is was the code name for it, and and in the film, uh, the sort of uh, the, the hero, um, you know, there's some anxiety that he might be having an affair, or someone might be having an affair because there's this name Ellie, and it keeps getting passed around, and and the wife of the the politician thinks who's this Ellie, you know, what's it all about, and it turns out to be a code for uh, extinction level event, um, and so you've got this really, really weird thing where the guy who discovered it, his name sort of incorporates these sort
sort of symbols mm -hmm. that we're familiar with through films and through our constellations. And so yes. On. And that creates a, a synchronicity, it creates this kind of coincidence that people think, whoa, <laughs> that's really weird. Um, and it is weird. And um, I, I think that's that, that sparked quite a lot of imagination with this. I, I don't think Ellen in itself is a threat to us. It is a small comet. It could be breaking up, as you say. It's very, very odd, as Richard Hoagland points out, that it achieves its closest point to the sun dead bang on the 10th anniversary of September the 11th. That's just, again, just plain weird. Mm. And he's, he's pointed out a number of other sort of um, synchronicities and alignments and so on to do with, you know, certain bodies in the solar system and certain artificial satellites and so on that he thinks are also relevant. Um, but uh, I, I'm not convinced that that need, you know, be something that we get really alarmed about. Um, but there is one other thing I sh think I should mention that is doing the rounds on the internet and may may have some significance. OK, well, you've got about a minute. So okay. okay. Yep. And that is that some people have said that Elenin is connected with the Japanese earthquake mm -hmm. back yeah. um, some months ago. Yes. And that there are two points in its cycle um, back then and also in November. Now, if these people are right, then it's possible that there could be a repeat event of the earthquake in November. Okay. That's only if they're right, right. and that's only if Elenin survives. Yes. Because what they're saying is the alignment with Earth creates some kind of resonance effect that's causing seismic activity. So I'm interested to see if that happens towards the end of November. Obviously, hope it doesn't, but yeah. if it does, there may be something to it. I think there's a bit of watch and see now, isn't there? Um, yeah. Because a lot has been said about alignments. I mean, from an astrological point of view, you know, an astrologer can tell you the alignments of what caused the Japanese earthquake. We don't have to go into Elenin for it. Mm. Um, the signature will be there within the chart. So, you know, there's always alignments going on. So, um, well, it's all very interesting. And I think you've, you've done an excellent job of presenting this information tonight. Thank you. And uh, well, we've run out of time. Okay. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for being a guest tonight, Andy. Uh, tell us your website. Um, it's called The Dark Star Theory. And uh, people just Google me, actually, Andy Lloyd. That's the easiest way of finding me. But it's darkstar1.co.uk. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, well, that's it for tonight. Um, I'm sorry to have teased you as a bit of a taster, wasn't it? But um, excellent information that he shared with us tonight. But that's it for tonight, I'm afraid. Uh, we've, we've run out of time. Um, I'll be back again with another show sometime, um, not next week, but the ne week after that. So uh, until next time, keep your eyes on the stars. <laughs> You're listening to www.peterbrot.fm. One station, many communities.